Summary, The Gifts of Imperfection, Brene Brown. Book link click here. Here's a summary of The Gifts of Imperfection. The author, Brene Brown, is a research professor who studies vulnerability, courage, worthiness, and shame. In her research, Brown found that people who live wholehearted lives marked by courage, compassion, and connection share specific characteristics. They practice self-compassion, embrace imperfections in themselves and others, live authentically, feel grateful, play and rest, and find meaning and purpose. Many obstacles get in the way of living wholeheartedly, including shame, perfectionism, exhaustion, scarcity, anxiety, self-doubt, and an inability to be vulnerable. To cultivate wholeheartedness wholeheartedness, Brown offers 10 guideposts. Cultivate authenticity by letting go of what people think Cultivate self-compassion by letting go of perfectionism Cultivate resilience by letting go of numbness and powerlessness Cultivate gratitude by letting go of scarcity and fear Cultivate intuition by letting go of the need for certainty Cultivate creativity by letting go of comparison Cultivate play and rest by letting go of exhaustion and productivity as self-worth Cultivate common stillness by letting go of anxiety Cultivate meaningful work by letting go of self-doubt and supposed to cultivate laughter song, and dance by letting go of being always in control. Ultimately, the path to wholeheartedness wholeheartedness is a journey, not a destination. It requires hard work, practice, and faith, but embracing ourselves, even if imperfect, allows us to find meaning, joy, and connection. The author describes 2007 as the year of her breakdown spiritual awakening. She says it felt like a breakdown but her friend Diana called it an awakening. The author thinks it was both. She says unravelings like this happen at significant life transitions, like marriage, parenting, recovery, moving, career changes, loss, or trauma. These are times when we feel called to live our authentic lives instead of the lives we think we're supposed to live. The author's unravelling was messy but made her feel joyful, brave, calm, and grounded for the first time. She learned to worry less about others' opinions and set boundaries. She started saying yes and no when she wanted to. Having gone through this journey, the author wanted to write a guidebook for others on living wholeheartedly. She researched by reading many memoirs and talking to her friend Diana. She collected journals, notes, and data to write this book, Wholehearted. The author now sees how hard but essential it is to own your story and love yourself. She sees that wholehearted living is a journey, not a destination. She considers that courage, compassion, and connection must be exercised daily. She believes that believing in herself and possibly living differently allowed her to make this journey. She hopes this book inspires and guides others to live and love wholeheartedly. The key message is that wholehearted living requires courage, compassion, and connection, which are daily practices. It involves owning your story, embracing imperfection, and believing in your worthiness. Though wholehearted living is a journey, the rewards of joy, calmness, and authenticity make it worthwhile. Brene Brown is a shameful researcher who has studied topics like vulnerability, courage, worthiness, and compassion for many years. In this excerpt, Brown shares a story of when she was invited to speak at an elementary school. When she arrived, she immediately sensed that something was off with the audience. The principal and PTO president's introductions were overly aggressive and made it seem like Brown was there to transform the school, making her completely uncomfortable. As Brown began speaking, she could tell the audience was unreceptive. One man, in particular, was loudly and dramatically sighing, rolling his eyes, and shifting exaggeratedly to show his disapproval. His behavior was so disruptive that the people sitting beside him seemed embarrassed. In hindsight, Brown wishes she had addressed the strange vibe she sensed. She thinks she should have walked up to the podium, told the audience she was simply there to speak, not transform their school, and asked what was happening. Instead, she started talking in her usual style, which did not resonate with this audience. The key themes here are the courage to speak up when something feels off, showing compassion for audiences by meeting them where they are, and making genuine connections with people to share a message. Brown believes practicing courage, compassion, and reference is how we cultivate a sense of worthiness. The author was giving a parenting talk to a large group. One audience member was unhappy and acting in a disruptive manner, throwing off the author's game. To win over the disgruntled parent, the author started exaggerating statistics and acting in an inauthentic way. This just ended up freaking out the rest of the audience. After the talk, the author felt deep shame over her behavior and struggle. She knew she needed to share this experience with a compassionate confidant to overcome these feelings, rather than hiding them. The author called her sister Ashley, who listened with empathy and shared some of her struggles. This allowed the author to feel both exposed yet loved, which helped alleviate her shame. Later, 
the author found out the school had set her up to address helicopter parents without telling her. The awkward situation resulted from a miscommunication and was not her fault. The author discusses how courage, compassion, and connection are the pillars of living wholeheartedly. Courage means speaking your truth and being vulnerable and imperfect. Compassion is showing empathy and understanding for others. Connection is finding people with whom you can share your authentic self. The writer drove Ellen home from a sleepover because Ellen asked her mom to pick her up. The writer told Ellen that asking for help when she needed it was brave. The writer has learned that pretending she didn't care about potentially exciting opportunities didn't make her less disappointed if they didn't happen. Now she expresses her excitement to close friends, and asks them for support if things don't work out. At her son's preschool holiday concert, the writer saw a mother arrive late and get comforted by two other mothers. They shared their own stories of parental imperfections to make her feel better. The writer thought this showed courage and compassion. The writer believes compassion involves facing our pain and discomfort. She cites the Buddhist nun Pima Chodron, who teaches that compassion comes from recognizing our shared humanity, including our capacity for cruelty. The writer has learned compassion requires setting boundaries and holding people accountable. She says living in a blame culture where we rage at people but rarely follow through with consequences prevents genuine compassion, understanding how boundaries, accountability, acceptance and compassion fit together has made her kinder and less judgmental. Connection refers to the energy between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued. We are wired for connection and need it to thrive. However, we often need to correct technology for authentic connection. We also need to let go of the myth of self-sufficiency and realize that we are both people who offer help and receive help. The path to living wholeheartedly requires courage, compassion and connection. It means being all in in our relationships and lives. Love and belonging are essential to humans. The only difference between people who feel love and belonging and those who struggle with it is a belief in their worthiness. When we accept ourselves, we gain access to our worthiness and to love and belonging. Our worthiness is unconditional, there are no prerequisites. Many believe they will be worthy when they achieve certain things, but worthiness exists now. Understanding love and belonging more profoundly is essential for owning our story and worthiness. The key points are that we must nurture real human connection, believe in our inherent worthiness, and develop a deeper understanding of love and belonging. Accepting ourselves as we are is the path to wholehearted living. The author explores the concepts of love and belonging. Some key points, love and belonging are basic human needs, but we rarely discuss their meaning. The author spent years researching and defining them. Love belongs with belonging. When people talked about one, they always discuss the other. Love and belonging will always be uncertain and hard to measure. But the absence of love and belonging leads to suffering. Love is cultivating a spiritual connection with another person, allowing our vulnerable selves to be seen. It grows from self-love and respect. Betrayal and damage the roots from which love grows. Belonging is the innate need to be part of something larger than us. We often try to gain it through fitting in and approval seeking, but that's different from belonging. Belonging comes from self-acceptance and showing our authentic selves. Practicing love means behaving with trust, respect, kindness and affection, not just saying I love you. Self-love and self-acceptance are priorities for cultivating love. Some debate whether we can love others more than ourselves. Loving others can inspire self-love, but self-love is still essential. Without it, we can hurt others and ourselves. But with children especially, our love for them can motivate us to work on self-love. The key conclusions are that love and belonging are fundamental human needs, but true love and belonging start with self-love and accepting our imperfect, authentic selves. Love is an action, not just a feeling. And while there is debate, self-love enables us to healthily and sustainably love others. The author and many accomplished speakers were invited to speak at a prestigious event called The Up Experience. She felt like an imposter and was terrified of the format which required a 20-minute TED-style talk. A friend advised her to tell stories from the heart rather than focus on research. The author struggled for weeks to prepare her to talk. When her husband asked how the preparation was going, she broke down in tears, revealing that she was blocked due to memories of bombing a talk five years earlier. She told him the story of that experience. At the earlier talk, the organizer was upset to learn the author studied shame and vulnerability. She demanded the author only discuss how to and keep things light and breezy. The author struggled through the talk only able to say superficial things about joy and meaning. Telling this story to her husband helped the author realize her work is really about the things that get in the way of joy and connection. She found her voice and felt ready to give her dead style talk. The key message is that addressing barriers and struggles, rather than just focusing on superficial how-tos, is necessary for real growth and progress. 
the author had to confront her past failure to move forward confidently. The author argues that we must discuss complex topics like shame, fear and vulnerability to grow and find meaning in life. Simply providing how-to tips and lists is not enough. We have to address the underlying issues that hold us back. The author shares her experience of giving a talk at a country club. At first, she was upset by the organizer's suggestion to keep things light and breezy and avoid complex topics, but she realized the request was more about the audience's discomfort than a judgment of her worth. Her talk focused on shame and vulnerability, which was very well received. The author says we know a lot about how to live healthy, balanced lives but struggle to do it because we don't discuss the obstacles like shame, fear and anxiety. These feelings drive us to make poor choices to escape discomfort. We have to learn how to navigate difficult emotions to find our way to worthiness and meaning. Shame is a universal human emotion and the fear of being unlovable. But we are afraid to talk about it, giving it more power over us. The author defines shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. To build shame resilience, we must recognize shame, confront it constructively while maintaining our self-worth, and find more extraordinary courage, compassion, and connection. Talking about shame and our struggles can help free us from perfectionism and the fear of judgment. While a single painful experience may threaten to define us, our wholeness contains both moments of struggle and moments of soaring. The key message is that fundamental transformation comes from addressing complex topics, not superficial how-tos. We must cultivate the courage to share our stories, the darkness and the light, to find our way to worthiness and meaning. Shame needs secrecy, silence, and judgment to grow. Sharing our experiences with shame helps us overcome it. We must understand what triggers shame and critically examine the messages that make us feel inadequate. Speaking about shame, using the word shame, sharing how we feel, and asking what we need help build shame resilience. Guilt is feeling bad about what we did. Shame is feeling wrong about who we are. Guilt motivates positive change, shame often leads to destructive behaviors. Shame is more likely to lead to hurtful behaviors than keep us in line. It is linked to violence depression, addiction, eating disorders, and bullying. The author shares an experience of receiving a critical email about a photo on her blog. Her instinct was to respond cruelly, but a friend helped her see that acknowledging hurt and not responding would be courageous. Naming shame, talking about it, sharing our story, and owning it are crucial to shame resilience. The author realized she was practicing shame resilience by feeling hurt, crying, communicating with a friend, and not responding to the email. A story the author shared in class revealed that the actual vulnerability and source of shame was allowing herself to be open and getting hurt, not just being criticized for a photo. The question was the shame really about feeling criticized for your photography? Forced her to reflect. The author realized that authenticity is not something you either have or lack. It is an ongoing practice of choosing to show up and be honest. It requires courage, compassion, and connection. An authentic life involves letting go of who you think you're supposed to be and embracing who you are, accepting imperfection and vulnerability and setting boundaries, showing compassion for yourself and others, recognizing everyone's struggles, feeling a sense of belonging by accepting you are enough. Practicing authenticity is challenging but invites more joy, gratitude and grace into your life. It means staying real even when it's hard or you feel inadequate or fearful. Choosing an authentic life can be disruptive to relationships as people adjust to you changing and becoming more self-accepting. Some may worry you're becoming self-centered or selfish. But authenticity is about embracing who you are, imperfections and all. It leads to more courage, compassion and connection. The author had to work through self-doubt and inadequacy to choose authenticity. But she found more freedom and joy by accepting herself, imperfections. An authentic life is worth fighting for, even sometimes tricky. It allows you to be fully who you are. Speaking authentically can be challenging, as it may trigger feelings of shame or pushback from others. However, hiding your authentic self can damage your mental health and relationships even more. Cultural expectations often discourage authenticity, especially for women and men. Women are expected to be thin, friendly and modest while men are expected to be emotionally controlled, focused on work, and pursue status. Going against these expectations can lead to criticism. While criticism always hurts, authenticity is about courage, not becoming immune to harm. Staying vulnerable is required for authentic connection. The risks of hiding your authentic self, anxiety, depression, addiction, resentment, often outweigh the risks of putting your true self out into the world. Perfectionism, the belief that you must be perfect to avoid shame and judgment, fuels authenticity and hinders success and happiness. It is not the same as healthy achievement and growth. 
A definition of perfectionism, perfectionism is a self-destructive and addictive belief system that fuels this primary thought, if I look perfect, live perfectly, and do everything perfectly, I can avoid or minimize the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. Perfectionism is unattainable, fuels more shame, and prevents taking risks and following dreams. The only way out is accepting imperfection in yourself and others. Ask yourself what's under my perfectionism? To better understand yourself and cultivate self-compassion. Our struggles with perfectionism say little about our worthiness or potential. The key message is that authenticity and embracing imperfection, despite the risks and discomfort, are needed for happiness, success, and meaningful relationships. Perfectionism stands in the way but can be overcome by practicing courage, vulnerability, and self-compassion. Perfectionism leads to feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. It increases the likelihood of experiencing these painful emotions and often results in self-blame. To overcome perfectionism, we must acknowledge our vulnerabilities to shame, judgment, and blame, develop shame resilience, and practice self-compassion. Embracing our imperfections leads to courage, compassion, and connection. Perfectionism exists on a continuum. For some, it only emerges occasionally, for others, it can be chronic and debilitating. Exploring our fears and changing our self-talk is vital to overcoming perfectionism. Practicing imperfection and faking it till you make it help. Self-compassion has three elements, self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. Self-kindness means being gentle with ourselves when we fail or feel inadequate. Common humanity means recognizing that suffering and inadequacy are part of the shared human experience. Mindfulness means not suppressing painful emotions but also not exaggerating them. Perfectionism impacts those around us, but compassion also spreads. When we are self-compassionate, we teach others and give them freedom to be authentic. Ways to develop self-compassion include using tools like the self-compassion scale, choosing a daily mantra like showing up is enough, and finding inspiration, like in Leonard Cohen's line there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. Resilience means overcoming adversity and being able to move forward. Understanding how some people can be resilient can help us cultivate resilience. Many of the people interviewed described becoming wholehearted despite facing struggles. Mindfulness and authenticity contribute to resilience under stress. Some can transform trauma into thriving. Resilience is a vital part of living wholeheartedly. Resilience refers to the ability to bounce back from difficulties. Resilient people share common traits like problem-solving skills, seeking help, belief in coping knowledge, social support, and connections. Spirituality emerged as foundational to resilience in research. Spirituality refers to believing in connection, a power greater than oneself, and that relationships are grounded in love. Spirituality brings meaning, purpose, and perspective. Hope is critical to resilience. Hope is not an emotion but a way of thinking that involves setting realistic goals, figuring out how to achieve them, and believing in yourself. Hope is learned, often from parents, and involves persistence and hard work. It requires being flexible and open to easy and challenging experiences. Powerlessness is dangerous and the opposite of hope. Power refers to the ability to effect change. We need to believe we can make change to live wholeheartedly. Practicing critical awareness, or reality checking messages, is crucial to resilience. We are bombarded with unrealistic messages about how to live. To practice essential understanding, ask if the images reflect reality, fantasy, healthy living, or objectification. Remember that these messages often aim to make money or gain control. Seeing the bigger picture helps combat shame and build resilience. When ashamed, we zoom in on our flaws, but zooming out helps us see others struggle similarly. This helps us reality check shame triggers and unrealistic expectations. The work of Jean Kilborn and Jackson Katz explores how media images relate to societal problems. Their work helps build critical awareness. In summary, resilience requires spirituality, hope, power, critical awareness, and connection. These help us set realistic expectations, achieve goals, overcome struggles, and live wholeheartedly. Advertising promotes unrealistic societal standards and values that negatively impact well-being. It sells images of success, popularity, love, and sexuality that tell us how we should be, often fostering feelings of inadequacy and leading to issues like loneliness, addiction, eating disorders, and teenage pregnancy. Many people use behaviors to numb themselves from difficult emotions like shame, fear, and sadness. This includes alcohol, drugs, food, relationships, work, spending, etc. While numbing behaviors provide temporary relief, they also numb positive emotions and prevent genuinely living wholeheartedly. 
addiction can be viewed as chronically and compulsively numbing oneself to avoid discomfort. Not all addictions are the same, and for some the disease model of addiction does not fully apply. Genetics and neurobiology play a role in addiction, but numbing behaviors are prevalent and addiction exists on a spectrum. There is no selective numbing of emotions. When we numb painful emotions, we also numb positive ones like joy. Leaning into discomfort and vulnerability is needed to experience the full range of good and bad feelings. Pleasure, like all emotions, contains elements of vulnerability and pain. Without tolerance for discomfort, we lose access to happiness. The research found that while numbing behaviors are prevalent, those living wholeheartedly are aware of the dangers of numbing and try to feel emotions rather than avoid them. They have developed the ability to navigate experiences of high vulnerability. The researcher shared her experiences with sobriety and overcoming various numbing behaviors. She found that viewing her struggles through the lens of vulnerability rather than strictly addiction was empowering and helped strengthen her commitment to health and well-being. In summary, the research suggests that numbness and avoidance of discomfort are widespread but prevent people from living wholeheartedly and accessing the full range of human emotions, both positive and negative. Recognizing numbing behaviors and learning to lean into vulnerability is crucial to well-being. Spirituality and resilience are connected. Feeling hopeless, fearful, in pain or disconnected undermines stability. Believing in human interconnectedness and something greater than ourselves brings compassion and strength. Practicing spirituality, like connecting with God or nature, builds resilience. Having purpose and meaning helps overcome adversity and stress. Without them, it's easy to lose hope or become overwhelmed. The concepts of love, belonging, gratitude and joy are interconnected. Feeling belonging requires self-love. Gratitude leads to satisfaction, not the reverse. Happiness depends on circumstances but joy comes from within. Gratitude and joy require practice, not just attitude. Keeping a gratitude journal, meditating on gratitude daily, and voicing gratitude help make it a tradition. Gratitude brings joy, which differs from happiness depending on spirit, not circumstances. Scarcity and fear block gratitude and joy. Believing there's not enough time, love, money or security creates fear and stops us appreciating what we have. We must face fear to experience joy. Looking at the light within ourselves and others allows us to sparkle. We can be lit from within through spirituality and practicing gratitude, joy, purpose, and meaning. The key points are that resilience and authentic belonging depend on spirituality and inner light. Gratitude and joy come from spiritual practice, not circumstance. Overcoming scarcity and fear allows us to appreciate life's beauty. When we connect with something greater through nature or God, we can find inner light, resilience, and joy. Joy comes in ordinary moments, fleeting bursts of light, not a constant floodlight. A joyful life comprises those moments strung together by trust, gratitude, inspiration, and faith. The author is prone to anxiety and fear, especially after becoming a mother. She would imagine terrible things happening when feeling joyful about her kids. She realized this fear of loss and vulnerability is common. We think avoiding joy will make the loss hurt less, but it just makes us miss out. Lynn Twist writes about the myth of scarcity, we always feel we lack enough of something. But we can choose a sufficiency mindset, knowing there is enough and we are enough. Absence feeds our gremlins and makes us feel only extraordinary things bring joy. But the most precious moments are often ordinary. To cultivate more joy, the author recommends, get deliberate, acknowledge fear, then transform it into gratitude. Say I'm feeling vulnerable. That's okay. I'm so grateful for. This increases capacity for joy. Get inspired, find joy in ordinary moments, like walking kids home, jumping on trampolines, and having family meals. See these moments are what matter. Get going, practice gratitude together, like being thankful during grace or creating a gratitude jar. Make wholeheartedness wholeheartedness a family affair. The author was surprised intuition, and faith emerged as keys to wholehearted living. She associates more with logic and reason. But her husband said she relies on intuition and trust often. She researched and found intuition is a rapid, unconscious associating process, not independent of reason. Faith is choosing to believe in something beyond the limits of our understanding. Both help make meaning and guide values and decisions. The author cultivated intuition through meditation and faith by embracing uncertainty. Both help find purpose and meaning. The author fondly remembers being creative as a child, especially in New Orleans. She recalls crafting with her mom, cooking, and sewing matching outfits. These memories are vivid and meaningful to her. However, her memories of creativity ended around age 8 or 9, when her family moved to Houston. After the move, everything seemed to change. 
In New Orleans, their home was decorated with art and homemade items. In Houston, the houses seemed fancy and impersonal, like hotel lobbies. School also changed, from a Catholic school where everyone was the same, to a public school where fashion and fitting in mattered more. The author's dad's schedule also changed, from being a law student at night in New Orleans to working long hours as a lawyer in Houston. The informal, fun feel of their family life disappeared. The author believes these changes led to them losing her creative spirit. Fitting in and achieving excellence became more important than expressing herself. She found less time for hobbies and crafts. Looking back, the author wishes she had held on to more of her creative self. She believes fitting in is overrated and that cultivating creativity leads to a more prosperous life. The critical message is that we should value and nurture our creativity, rather than lose it in pursuit of fitting in or meeting expectations. Creativity and self-expression are vital parts of a whole life. Does this summary accurately reflect the passage's key details and central message? Let me know if you want me to clarify or expand on any summary part. The author and her family moved to Houston when she was young. The move marked a shift to focusing on accomplishments, competition, and comparison rather than creativity. Comparison leads to conformity and competition as people try to fit in but stand out. It steals happiness and authenticity. The author came to resent creativity and see it as self-indulgent. Her research on wholehearted living changed her view. She realized everyone is creative in some way, and creativity gives life meaning. She started creating again through activities like photography and art projects with her family. Letting go of comparison requires constant awareness. Creativity helps us focus on our path rather than comparing ourselves to others. The author encourages, getting deliberate by making time for creativity. It improves life in many ways. Getting inspired by finding a community of like-minded creative people. Getting going by taking a class in something that scares you or you've dreamed of trying. The author initially needed to recognize the importance of play to wholehearted living. Space shapes the brain, builds empathy, enables social navigation, and spurs creativity. Play is purposeless, done just for the fun of it. This is hard for many as worth and productivity are valued, but play combats depression and is essential to health. We must make time for play and rest, though they may seem like a waste of time. They rejuvenate us and support meaning, creativity, and relationships. In summary, the keys to meaning and wholehearted living are, creativity, play, rest, and avoiding comparison. Though difficult, they must be prioritized to live an authentic life of purpose and joy. Play transforms work and brings excitement, newness, and creativity. It helps deal with difficulties and find meaning. The need for play is similar to the need for rest. Both are essential for health, yet resisting them is common. Lack of rest has serious health consequences but is seen by some as a badge of honor. The author and her husband made a list of things that bring their family joy and meaning, like sleep, healthy food, downtime, and time together. They realized striving for accomplishments and acquisitions did not provide a definition. Choosing rest and play over productivity and busyness is countercultural but essential. The author's daughter resisted reducing her activities at first but came to appreciate more downtime. The author still struggles with choosing, worrying her daughter will miss opportunities. But their happiness and closeness matter most. The author started getting dizzy from anxiety and stress. Her therapist helped her see she needed to reduce her anxiety, not just cope. She cultivated calm and stillness, which are different but both necessary. Calm means maintaining perspective, managing emotional reactions, and considering the situation before responding. The author tries to answer slowly and thinks if she has enough information. She knows calm begets more calm. Stillness is making time to be non-reactive and non-productive. It means sitting with emotions rather than reacting, and embracing solitude. The author values stillness for reducing anxiety, fostering creativity, and gaining insight. Finding meaning, connection, and purpose reduces anxiety, as does self-care. The author focuses on what she can control and accepts what she cannot. She practices mindfulness, meditation, exercise, sleep, healthy eating, downtime, and professional counseling. Wholehearted living requires choosing rest over exhaustion and play over productivity. It means embracing calm and stillness, and finding meaning in simple moments together rather than perpetual advancement and acquisition. Anxiety is contagious, but so is calm. We can choose to spread relaxation instead of anxiety. Practicing calm involves counting to 10 before responding, saying we need to think about something, and identifying emotions that trigger reactivity. An example is a public service announcement showing a couple screaming at each other to represent practicing calm. Stillness is creating an emotional clearing, 
not just focusing on nothingness. It allows us to feel, think, dream, and question. Stillness can be anxiety-provoking because we must confront fears and truths about our lives. We are also raised to believe peace is sitting still, rather than an emotional clearing. Increase deliberate practices like exercise and decrease caffeine to cultivate calm and stillness. See anxiety responses as patterns, not permanent. Experiment with different forms of stillness and quiet. Meaningful work involves using our gifts and talents. Not using them leads to distress. Sharing gifts provides a spiritual connection. Commitment is required because meaningful work may not pay the bills. No one can define meaning for us. Self-doubt and supposed to's are barriers to meaningful work. We need to be more confident in our abilities and feel we are supposed to do certain types of work. Breaking free requires courage, clarity on gifts, and support. The key ideas are practicing common stillness to spread them rather than anxiety, using our gifts for meaningful work, and overcoming self-doubt and supposed to's that get in the way. The overall message is that we can cultivate more common meaningful living rather than be overwhelmed by anxiety and lack of purpose. Three things that get in the way of meaningful work are self-doubt, feelings of not being enough, and struggling to define who we are. Gremlins, or negative self-talk, fuel self-doubt by telling us we lack talent or gifts, or that meaningful work isn't practical. The phrase you're supposed to also undermines meaningful work by insisting we meet other people's expectations. We must acknowledge the gremlins' messages to overcome and reject these obstacles. We can redefine ourselves by embracing slash careers that combine multiple passions, like researcher slash writer or accountant slash jeweler. This helps us own who we are and do work we find meaningful. Meaningful work should inspire, be creative, and promote contemplation. We can cultivate it by identifying what makes us come alive and pursuing that. Reading books like One Person slash Multiple Careers and The Alchemist can help inspire us. Laughter song, and dance are vital forms of expression that connect us. They embody joy but comfort us in times of fear, grief, and loneliness. Knowing laughter shares the relief of everyday experiences. Music stirs emotion and memories. Dance gives us freedom to express ourselves. Engaging in these remind us we are not alone. Collective ecstasy, or shared joy, is an innate human drive. Though life often feels fearful and anxious now, we can foster connection through laughter, song, and dance. They create emotional and spiritual bonds, transformation comes from sharing these experiences. With music, felt anticipatory and emotional while watching the film on the edge of my seat hoping for things to turn out a certain way without music, the scene felt flat and factual, not emotional didn't have the same level of anticipation music offers us a connection that we can't live without. Music elicits emotion and brings us together, whether a hymn, national anthem, fight song, or movie scene. Dancing is a sign of spiritual health and connection in the family. Not fancy dancing, just moving together to music we enjoy. Though dance can make us feel vulnerable, it's in our DNA. Children naturally want to dance until they learn to be self-conscious. The desire to seem cool and in control prevents us from expressing ourselves fully. We want to manage how others perceive us to feel worthy. But we miss out on life by pretending to be excellent. It's essential to allow ourselves to be vulnerable and authentic. Betraying ourselves by stifling expression to seem cool also leads us to cross others the same way. We put them down for expressing themselves to make us feel better about not doing so. But life is too short to pretend to be relaxed instead of laughing, singing, and dancing. Put on music while doing chores or create playlists for different moods to make space for expression and connection. Share stories of times you felt free to be uncool. Be an example by expressing yourself without shame. Offer encouragement when others are freely expressing themselves. The author discovered qualitative research in the grounded theory methodology during her doctoral studies. She was trained by Barney Glazer, one of the founders of grounded theory. The critical premise of grounded theory is to start research with as few assumptions as possible. The author started with questions about human connection and shame and then developed new questions based on what emerged from the data. The author's research is based on collecting stories through interviews and field notes. Over 10 years, she has managed over 10,000 accounts and interviewed nearly 1,000 people. People have also shared stories through letters, emails, her blog, and courses. To analyze the stories, the author looks for themes and patterns to develop theories. Rather than imposing her interpretations, she tries to capture what participants said and meant. The coding and analysis process is complex and laborious. A key feature of grounded theory is that theories are constantly evolving based on new data. The author must continue checking new stories against existing approaches to see if they hold up and revise them as needed. She considers this challenge part of what she loves about her work.
The author did not initially seem like a typical researcher to some, as a soccer mom rather than an older white guy. But her non-traditional path ultimately led her to discover and excel in qualitative research on human experiences. Overall, the summary highlights how the author came to do grounded theory research on human connection, shame, and worthiness using stories shared by thousands of participants. Her theories have emerged from and continue to be refined by this deep engagement with people's lived experiences. Book link click here.